Hello and welcome to Scribefest and this session is about creatively engaging young people and I'm Louise Baudet. I'm both a parish council clerk um, but also by professional background and occupational therapist. So just to sort of share a bit about myself, got a, a strong background in local government, working in education, town centre management, working with schools. Um, I've also sort of worked for myself um, initially in business and marketing um, but also done a lot of work, sort of voluntary work with the community. And as I said, being a parish clerk for many years, either on a permanent or locum basis, and lots of experience of consulting with young people, engaging with community and developing facilities in local parishes. So as an occupational therapist, I'm a member of the Royal College of Occupational Therapy. I'm HCPC registered. And my background is in child and adolescent mental health and also paediatrics. Um, on a personal level, done lots of work within the community, always been very active, running support groups, running activities for children and families, um, we set up special needs toy library and play group. So always been quite heavily involved in the community. So thinking about today's session and what we're going to cover, uh, we're going to first of all be looking at why it's important to engage young people and how you use that to develop a youth engagement strategy. We're going to think a bit about why occupational therapy as well. It is an occupational based, evidence based profession um, and the approach that we use with engaging young people. What do you already know about the young people? You've got a lot of information that you can use already and it's about how to build on that. And then also at the end, thinking about sort of how you take that forward in terms of engagement, some ideas, some suggestions about how you can engage with young people in different ways and really get a feel for who they are and what they want. So just to also mention that this presentation, it isn't about engaging young people uh, democratically or getting them involved in politics. It's really to take that view of how do you understand their lived experience, what it's like to live in your parish, what it's like to go to school and learn in your parish, what it's like to have friends there, how they spend their leisure time. So really give that feel about living and growing up in a parish, but also their future needs. What would they like to see? So why should councils be engaging with young people? Well, anybody that's got children or grandchildren know that they're like a, a breath of fresh air. Um, they often come up with very fresh, inspirational ideas, lots of constructive ideas and contribute to decision making in a positive way and bring a fresh pair of eyes to things that sometimes when you've worked in the system for a long time, um, you get used to doing the same things the same way, don't you? So they really do bring that fresh pair of eyes. It gives the young people in your parish an opportunity to express themselves, but to do that in a very safe and supportive way, um, you know, where they feel that they, they can voice their opinions, where they can feel listened to. And it reassures young people that the issues and opinions that they have are listened to and they are taken seriously and acknowledging what they bring in terms of their ideas and their knowledge and their experiences and their views. And that's really important. Also, as counsellors, um, and also clerks can build those intergenerational relationships within the community. So working with the children, the young adolescents as they go into early adulthood, with parents, with grandparents. So it's really been quite holistic in how you engage with the people that live in your parish. And it also helps those young people feel part of the community and feeling that they can contribute to changing and shaping what goes on in the area that they live with. So there's lots of really good, valuable reasons about why it's important to engage with young people. So these are just a, a couple of uh, pieces of research that were done. Um, the first one is one that was done in 2011 by the British Youth Council called the Big Listen Survey. So this was a survey of a thousand young people in the UK and it found that 82% of them believe it's important for them to be able to speak up about their local area. And six out of 10 young people felt that their views were taken less seriously in local decision-making simply because of their age. And I think that's quite important when we live in a society that should be inclusive and not discriminate. You know, and age is often one of those areas where people can be discriminated against, whether that's because they're young or, or old. It's really important to embrace that and make sure that as a parish council, you're promoting an inclusive society. Then the other one, the British Social Values Attitudes that was done in 2010. A bit similar to the British Youth Council, it also found that young people felt that their views were treated more negatively than those of adults. And I think this is where having that youth engagement strategy can really demonstrate that actually you want to hear the views of young people and there is a way to connect with them. 
So thinking about what you already know about the young people that live in your parish. So there's lots of information that is there already before you even start a consultation process. So you've already got things like demographic data about the number of households, um, who's living there, the ages and things like that. You've got information about things such as free school meals and household income. Um, and you might sort of think, well, you know, how's that going to help us? But actually, the, the level of household income can affect the life experiences that young people have and the opportunities that they have. So they might not have had opportunities to experience things that perhaps in other areas young children might have experienced. And they might not have the same access to facilities and resources um, that perhaps other areas have. So it is quite important because it helps us understand their lived experience. And similarly, youth and employment as well. How are they spending their time? What is their income at their disposal? Um, so it's thinking again, again about that situation around perhaps poverty, which I think we're seeing more and more of now with lots of rising costs. So also thinking about what networks are already available. So within your parish, you might have a youth council set up already. You might have youth groups already set up and running. There can be other community groups. Um, a good look at the sort of hiring for your village hall. You'll probably see lots of groups such as uh, scouts, such as beavers, girl guides. You can have dance groups, karate groups, drama groups, singing groups. So have a look what's already out there and what groups are meeting. Um, and then of course, local schools and education so whether you've got a school in your parish or one nearby or a college in your parish and try and think why do think what else that you've you've already got there so what next thinking about how actually do you take that next step forward you do your data collection think about what you already know and then you're thinking about how do we start to engage with the young people and find out what life is like for them in your parish and what are their aspirations for the future so to do this, I'm going to use a, a case study to just facilitate that discussion um, about how you might go about it. And it's really just to broaden the thinking and give you some ideas um, about different ways of engaging people. So this was a, a parish council um, that wanted to review what they were offering young people in the air area and think about gathering the views of the young people, particularly the older age range, which you know can sometimes be quite difficult to make that contact and to get those conversations going. So we thought about a youth engagement strategy and what that would look like and what the objectives of that strategy would be. So very strongly there is about empowering young people, making sure that they've got a voice and that voice is heard. Then about thinking about how you actually engage with them and the sorts of issues that young people are facing today, um, what their needs are and what their aspirations for the future are. So the, the the things that are facing young people today might be very different to things that we faced when, when we were their age um, and trying to get a really good understanding of that. Thinking about how you participate with young people and make sure that young people are involved in the pathway in the decision making process. So, you know, they're getting their voice heard. How do you translate that and move it forward so that what they're voicing is part of your decision making processes and how do you incorporate that and validate it? thinking about how you promote what's available to young people so that they know sort of what decisions are being made about the area and what's available to them. And then as part of working together to recognise the skills, knowledge and resources that are available throughout the area and working together to make sure that the lives of young people are improved. So this was very much about that partnership working. So that could be linking in with organisations that are perhaps national organisations. Um, they could be organisations that are in neighbouring parishes. They could be organisations at um, a county, district or borough level. So thinking very much about things like your parks departments, um, if there's um, a, a youth strategy that's there, um, thinking about the work of your your borough councillors and your district councillors and county councillors and some of the initiatives that they might be doing and also looking at you know the voluntary sector you know there's often quite a lot that's, that's out there with organisations such as Bernardo's and places like that so having that sort of wider view um, and thinking very systemically um, about what you can tap into and what you can draw on and that also links in when you start to think about funding as well and the different funding pots and priorities that are out there so that when you get to that decision making stage and you want to start introducing new things or making changes you know what's out there 
So the next bit is just thinking about why an occupational therapist is part of this process. So we work in lots of settings. We can work in hospitals with older people, in prisons, in schools. You know, we work in, in so many settings. But one of the big areas that we do work in is with children and young people, whether that's in a, a mental health setting. So your child and adolescent mental health services or paediatric settings. So that very much looks at children's development and functional skills. So our, our background, our training is very specialist and it's all about engaging people in activities of daily living and making sure that people can access and participate in the things that they want to. We focus very much on what we call meaningful activities. So these are not just from taking part in things because they're there or because they're told to do so. It's what actually motivates them, what has a meaning for them and what really gets their engines moving and makes them really sort of excited about things. So we're quite holistic in the way that we approach our work with children and young people. We also use a, a range of evidence-based assessment tools. Um, a simple example for, for this was the interest checklist that we use, which is quite far reaching in terms we look at a whole range of interests and hobbies, and we look at whether or not they've participated in it before, whether they can at the moment, if it's something they'd like to do for the future. And we think about why that works for them or what are their barriers to accessing things that they're interested in. We also have quite specialist knowledge in, in areas such as child development, their functional skills, mental health, and sort of things like additional needs and sensory processing. So when you start to, to get a feel for what a life feels like for a young person, you're often bringing in that specialist knowledge. And then our therapeutic skills, engaging with children and young people as well. So as occupational therapists, what do we do? So we look, we do look at how children and young people live their lives on a daily basis. So that's why it ties in so nicely with the youth engagement strategy. So we look at the things that they need to do. And very often this is about their daily routines. And when we're thinking of play and recreation, it's understanding where that fits in their daily routines, why it's important um, and what their barriers might be to accessing that. We look at things they have to do. So very often school age children, it's around going to school. Um, for older children, it might be going to college, doing voluntary work, Work, employment or you you know it could be those that aren't engaged in anything at all and then the things that they want to do so how they spend their time with their family with their friends their social circles what their hobbies and interests are how they relax and we piece all that together to form this holistic picture of what that young person's life looks like so again that really aligns with when we're trying to do a youth engagement strategy and make decisions for the future you've got that understanding of what young children's lives are like and what they want in the future. But when we're thinking about play and recreation as a meaningful activity, it's often very different at different developmental stages and different ages. Um, it's a very subjective experience um, and it's one that comes from engaging freely in something that they've chosen to do. Um, so we think about the environment where play takes place and how they engage and participate and everybody's experience is very different and it changes over time and the key factors that are around that change are often around their age, the stage of development and their gender. So when we're looking at early years and early childhood, it's very much about being a driver for learning and development. Um, their play is very different, it's about exploring there's a lot about functionality and manipulation. So we're looking at what we call their fine motor skills and their gross motor skills. So your fine motor skills is your ability to use your fingers to grasp, to manipulate. So if you think of things that are in your, your playgrounds, you know, perhaps some of the activity boards and things like that. Um, and your gross motor skills, it, skills is all about your balance and your co coordination and how you move. So again, on the playground, seeing a lot of those gross motor skills, whether a child's playing football or using play equipment for climbing, or going down the slide or going on the swing. It's also about engaging socially and forming those friendships. And it often tends to be quite energetic play at this age. We all know that toddlers and youngsters, they seem to have boundless energy um, and always sort of on the go. And it's also about pretend play and creating those environments that are safe where they can form those friendships and play. There's a lot of evidence base that's around the social, developmental and health benefits for children of this age range. So then we sort of look, you know, as they start to get older and go into those teenage years and young adults, 
And it's all at this age about how they transition into becoming an adult. And there's a lot more focus on their leisure interests and their hobbies. And it tends to be more things that they're choosing to do. But they're still developing at this stage. So cognitively, emotionally, physically, they're still developing and learning skills. And also that big word for changes in their attitudes. And that's when they start to explore and start to develop their own personality and their own characteristics. And it's very much, you know, you'll hear parents say about them pushing the boundaries, testing the boundaries. And that really is what they're doing at, at this age. And in some cases, that can mean that, you know, perhaps some of their behaviours um, might be a bit challenging, might not be acceptable to everyone. But it's providing safe environments where they can test those boundaries as and learn what is OK and what isn't and start to build the foundation for their, their life values. Teenagers will often start to view their peer groups as important and influential. So, you know, whereas when they were younger, you'd see them down the park with perhaps mom, dad, and some other families with parents there. At this age, they, they want to go out, they're building their relationships and their friendships, and they're starting to experiment with their independence. They still need time to have fun and to go out and play. They might not call it play, but spending that time with their friends, even messing about on the equipment and things like that, or just sitting on the bench chatting, is their version of play, it's things that they're choosing to do and finding out what they enjoy doing. So for teenagers, play is predominantly about being sociable. It's about making friends, connecting with friends and building up those relationships and having the freedom to decide for themselves how they're going to have fun. So an analysis of teenage behaviour during play shows that their behaviour mimics and practices being an adult and it's a positive stage in terms of their development. So the, the consultation that we did, what we were looking at is trying to get some quantitative data, but also qualitative data so that we could really understand the lived experiences of the young people. Sort of broke the age ranges down to 7 to 10 years and 11 to 17 years. Um, and we wanted to hear the views of those young people and recognise that they would probably be very different. In terms of how we communicated, we developed a communication mix. So not relying on one sort of um, approach in terms of communicating. So not just using written questionnaires, but thinking about using visual things such as using videos through a Facebook page, using digital. So setting up WhatsApp groups and things like that um, and really providing a, a good mix doing face-to-face -face activities as well. Um, so everybody had an opportunity to engage in a different way. And this was really important because children and young people, you know, they're learning and developing, they're not always confident and it might mean stepping outside their comfort zone. So the more different ways that we could offer them, the more likely they were to engage with us. We also thought about those hard to reach groups. So um, children and young people where they might have additional needs, perhaps things like they might have ADHD or be on the autistic spectrum and be less likely to engage. And that also included that higher risk of young people where they're perhaps testing those boundaries and making lifestyle choices, um, but are perhaps pushing back against how they've grown up and what other people want. And they might not want to engage in, in this or might not see it as a cool thing to do. So we were thinking about how we'd engage with them. And then sort of in terms of publicity, um, putting things in the local media, sending information to the schools, the going to school newsletters, but also utilising the, the communication mechanisms that were already there, such as parish newsletters, Facebook pages, websites, and things like that, um, using the good parish council things, things on the notice boards, but also things like using social media as well. So what we developed there was it was a quite a comprehensive and holistic communication mix, um, so that it was in its broadest sense so that we could try and capture everyone. And there were two focuses to the, the consultation. Um, the first focus, which was the main one, was about understanding how children live and grow up in the parish and what makes a good experience for that young person. So we wanted to gather information about their views about where they live, what was good about the area, what was bad about the area, their leisure time experiences. So how do they spend their time and what makes that time important to them? Um, and the, the strong thing that came out through that was always they wanted to be with their friends, they wanted that social connection, and they wanted their own spaces and places to be able to do that. Um, the meeting places and facilities available. So, you know, when they had free time, where were they going? What were they using in, in the parish? And then thinking about any barriers that were there and any dilemmas that they were faced. So thinking about things like, did they feel safe when they were out and about? Um, thinking 
about things like bullying. So were they scared to go down the path because there were people there that were bigger, that were older than them, or were perhaps doing things that they didn't like or felt uncomfortable? So thinking very much about those barriers um, that stopped them engaging in things that they wanted to do. And then the desired change, what was their vision for the future? You know, we'd found out what they liked, what they didn't like, we gathered a picture of what their days looked like, what did they want for the future? Um, and then sort of thinking about their voice as part of that process. So did they feel that they were heard or did they feel that they had an opportunity to influence what was going on in the area? And if they weren't, how would they like that to look in the future? You know, very often it's not about, well, they can come along to a parish council meeting. It's thinking about how else you can do that. And certainly sort of like thinking about other local groups in the area and them feeling comfortable in, in engaging and doing that partnership joined up working with things so for example a young person that perhaps goes to finds every week you know they're there with their peers with their friends that they feel comfortable with and they have positive um connections with that because they're doing things that they enjoy and they're having fun the adults there are adults that they're familiar with that they trust so if you're thinking about future partnership working how you could tap into what's already there to engage young people and then the second piece of the focus was on the facilities and the equipment that was available in the parish. Um, what did they use? What did they enjoy? What didn't they use? And what did they want to see in the future? And also thinking about, you know, if they went outside the parish to do things, um, what sort of things they enjoyed doing outside the parish. So how we broke that down into how we engaged with the young people. So this was looking at the age range of children aged seven to 10 years. So we, what we did is we set up some activity sessions um, where they came along and they did some crafts. Um, they made pizza, they did some gardening, they decorated some plant pots. Um, we decorated some money pots and things like that. And we filtered throughout of that some mini questionnaires as well. Um, to get some feedback about the sorts of activities that they enjoyed doing, but also just the atmosphere and them coming along, enjoying the session, being with other young people. We found that they opened up quite easily, um, had lots and lots of ideas about things that they would like to be doing, how they spent their time. So it was a really great opportunity to get a feel um, for how young people enjoyed where they live and what they wanted. Uh, we looked at doing voting wars where you could put things up and they'd put ticks and stickers on there um, to get that interaction because not every young person um, enjoys group work. Some people can be quite shy, they could be quite nervous, it might be out of their comfort zone. So we were looking at ways that young people could participate without actually having to come along and do something. Um, there was a competition which was around designing a piece of dream playground equipment. Um, so that we took two angles, either they could design something or they could draw something that they really enjoyed, that they liked. We had um, dedicated social media pages. So we had a Facebook page, a Twitter account, and an Instagram account. Um, the, what we did was we posted either YouTube clips or we posted pictures or questions and gave them an opportunity to comment on them. And everybody that commented, they got entered into a, a prize draw to win some vouchers. Um, we also did a questionnaire as well with a prize draw and we used the QR code as well so that they could just scan the QR code um, and do it online. We also use SurveyMonkey as well, but they could access a questionnaire as well. Um, copies of the questionnaires were hand delivered to every household in the area. Um, so we made sure that we targeted all the families there. And then we also arranged what we call play days. So these were family days out. So visits to, um, they were offered a couple of local parks to test out the equipment, to say what they liked um, about it, what they would use, um, and also a, a cinema trip as well. Um, was offered to them. So then looking at sort of like the, the older age range, so young people age 11 years plus. So it was quite quite similar in terms of what we offered, but obviously changed um, sort of the activities that they would be doing. Um, where we had sort of like what we call the hard to reach families, particularly those with special needs, um, we offered to go out and see them either in the home or perhaps doing a session at school um, and sort of doing that work with the parents beforehand to get to know what would make a young person anxious, what would make it enjoyable for them, um, so that we were really using a therapeutic approach and being sensitive to their additional needs and have that understanding, particularly as often around additional needs, there's a lot around communication, perhaps they've got literal understanding of things. Um, 
so that we could get the most out of that interaction with them. And also they felt that they were being listened to and engaged. So getting that handover from a family was an important part before that. Um, and often also thinking about taking something along, a little craft activity, something that they enjoyed doing to put them at their ease. And, you know, again, it comes back to that meaningful activity of doing something that they enjoyed. So there was less of a focus on parents because the emphasis was on the views of the child. Um, but obviously if parents sort of wanted the feedback, we were open and accepting to having, having that feedback from them. So in, in terms of the outcomes, you know, there was a relatively good return of the hard copy questionnaires. Um, the use of social media links worked really well and the survey monkey and the QR codes. So really very few hard copies returned, but they accessed the questionnaire through other mediums. Um, we found that Facebook had quite a good engagement level, but less so on Instagram and Twitter. And I think sort of, you know, learning from that, thinking about what social media young people use in terms of WhatsApp and things like that. Um, the use of the incentives worked well as well, the, you know, getting some vouchers and being entered into a prize draw, but also incentives in terms of like the face-to-face -face activities and the play days of them getting to do something that they enjoyed. Um, that was perhaps the most successful. And then less interesting things like the art competitions as well, um, would have hoped to have seen more around that. So engaging the young people in the very practical hands-on seemed to really work quite well. And we got a really good picture of what a typical everyday life looked like for the young people and um, what was important to them. And as I said before, something that came out strongly was being able to connect with friends, feeling safe and having things to do as well. So there was a lot, you know, around they wanted things within their parish that they could participate in, that they could enjoy. And what also came out as well was that they valued their safe space and they were motivated by opportunities to engage in activities. So these were just a couple of pictures of some of the things that we did with the young people. And if you have any questions, um, that's my contact. Thank you for listening.